Welcome once again to the garden of the deanery at Canterbury Cathedral. We've finished our morning filming of services and the rain has come on, so we've come into the greenhouse to continue the reading of Robert Louis Stevenson's Travels with a Donkey in the Cévennes. We're beginning part two, which is called Upper Gévaudan. And as with part one, there is a quotation from another book. This time, Stevenson has given us a quote from Pilgrim's Progress. The way also here was very wearisome, through dirt and slabbiness, nor was there on all this ground so much as one inn or vitlin house wherein to refresh the feebler sort. Stevenson is travelling in the month of September 1878 and the chapter, chapter 4, is called A Camp in the Dark. The next day, Tuesday, September the 24th, it was two o'clock in the afternoon before I got my journal written up and my knapsack repaired, for I was determined to carry my knapsack in the future and have no more ado with baskets. And half an hour afterwards, I set out for Le Chéard l'Évêque, a place on the borders of the forest of Mercoire. A man, I was told, should walk there in an hour and a half, and I thought it scarce too ambitious to suppose that a man encumbered with a donkey might cover the same distance in four hours. All the way up the long hill from Longogne, it rained and hailed alternately. The wind kept freshening steadily, although slowly. Plentiful hurrying clouds, some dragging veils of straight rain shower, others massed and luminous, as though promising snow, careered out of the north and followed me along my way. I was soon out of the cultivated basin of the Allier, and away from the ploughing oxen and such like sights of the country. More heathery marsh, tracts of rock and pines, woods of birch all jewelled with the autumn yellow, here and there a few naked cottages and bleak fields. These were the characters of the country. Hill and valley followed valley and hill. The little green and stony cattle tracks wandered in and out of one another, split into three or four, died away in marshy hollows and began again sporadically on hillsides or at the borders of a wood. There was no direct road to Chélard and it was no easy affair to make a passage in this uneven country and through this intermittent labyrinth of tracks. It must have been about four when I struck saint and went on my way rejoicing in a sure point of departure. Two hours afterwards, the dusk rapidly falling, in a lull of the wind, I issued from a fir wood where I had long been wandering and found not the looked-for village, but another marish bottom among the rough and tumble hills. For some time past, I had heard the ringing of cattle bells ahead, and now, as I came out of the skirts of the wood, I saw near upon a dozen cows and perhaps as many more black figures, which I conjectured to be children, although the mist had almost unrecognisably exaggerated their forms. These were all silently following each other round and round in a circle, now taking hands, now breaking up with chains and reverences. A dance of children appeals to very innocent and lively thoughts, but at nightfall on the marshes, the thing was eerie and fantastic to behold. Even I, who am well enough read in Herbert Spencer, felt a sort of silence for, for an instant on my mind. The next, I was pricking Modestine forward and guiding her like an unruly ship through the open. In a path, she went doggedly ahead of her own accord, as before a fair wind. But once on the turf, or among heather, and the brute became demented, the tendency of lost travellers to go round in a circle was developed in her to the degree of passion, and it took all the steering I had in me to keep 
even a decently straight course through a single field. While I was thus desperately tacking through the bog, children and cattle began to disperse, until only a pair of girls remained behind, and from these I sought direction on my path. The peasantry in general were but little disposed to counsel a wayfarer. One old devil simply retired into his house and barricaded the door on my approach, and I might beat and shout myself hoarse, he turned a deaf ear. Another, having given me a direction which, as I found afterwards, I had misunderstood, complacently watched me going wrong without adding a sign. He did not care a stalk of parsley if I wandered all night upon the hills. As for these two girls, they were a pair of impudent sly sluts with not a thought but mischief. One put out her tongue at me, the other bade me follow the cows, and they both giggled and jogged each other's elbows. The beast of Gévaudan ate about a hundred children of this district. I began to think of him with sympathy. Leaving the girls, I pushed on through the bog and got into another wood and upon a well-marked road. It grew donker, darker and darker. Modestine suddenly began to smell mischief bettered the pace of her own accord, and from that time forward gave me no trouble. It was the first sign of intelligence I had occasion to remark in her. At the same time, the wind freshened into half a gale, and another heavy discharge of rain came flying up out of the north. At the other side of the wood, I sighted some red windows in the dusk. This was the hamlet of Fusiek, three houses on a hillside, near a wood of birches. Here I found a delightful old man who came a little way with me in the rain to put me safely on the road for Shedard. He would hear of no reward, but shook his hands above his head almost as if in menace and refused volubly and shrilly in unmitigated patois. All seemed right at last. My thoughts began to turn upon dinner and a fireside, and my heart was agreeably softened in my bosom. Alas, and I was on the brink of new and greater miseries. Suddenly, at a single swoop, the night fell. I have been abroad in many a black night, but never in a blacker. A glimmer of rocks, a glimmer of the track where it was well beaten, a certain fleecy density, or night within night for a tree, this was all that I could discriminate. The sky was simply darkness overhead. Even the flying clouds pursued their way invisibly to human eyesight. I could not distinguish my hand at arm's length from the track, nor my goad at the same distance from the meadows or the sky. Soon the road that I was following split after the fashion of the country, into three or four in a piece of rocky meadow. Since Modestine had shown such a fancy for beaten roads, I tried her instinct in this predicament. But the instinct of an ass is what might be expected from the name. In half a minute she was clambering round and round among some boulders, as lost a donkey as you would wish to see. I should have camped long before had I been properly provided, but as this was to be so short a stage, I had brought no wine, no bread for myself, and little over a pound for my lady friend. Add to this that I and Modestine were both handsomely wetted by the showers, but now, if I could have found some water, I should have camped at once in spite of all. Water, however, being entirely absent, except in the form of rain, I determined to return to Fuzik and ask a guide a little farther on my way. A little farther, lend thy guiding hand, as the quotation goes. The thing was easy to decide, hard to accomplish. In this sensible roaring blackness I was sure of nothing but the direction of the wind. To this I set my face. The road had disappeared 
and I went across country, now in marshy opens, now baffled by walls unscalable to Modestine, until I came once more in sight of some red windows. This time they were differently disposed. It was not Fusillique, but Fusillac, a hamlet little distant from the other in space, but worlds away in the spirit of its inhabitants. I tied Modestine to a gate and groped forward, stumbling among rocks, plunging mid-leg in bog, until I gained the entrance of the village. In the first lighted house there was a woman who would not open to me. She could do nothing. She cried to me through the door, being alone and lame. But if I would apply at the next house, there was a man who could help me if he had a mind. They came to the next door in force, a man, two women and a girl, and brought a pair of lanterns to examine the wayfarer. The man was not ill-looking, but had a shifty smile. He leaned against the doorpost and heard me state my case. All I asked was a guide as far as Shelar. Ce que voyez-vous il fait noir, said he. I told him that was just my reason for requiring help. I understand that, said he, looking uncomfortable. Mais c'est de la peine. I was willing to pay, I said. He shook his head. I rose as high as ten francs, but he continued to shake his head. Name your own price then, said I. Ce n'est pas ça, he said at length, and with evident difficulty, but I am not going to cross the door, mais je ne sortirai pas de la porte. I grew a little warm and asked him what he proposed that I should do. Where are you going beyond Sheila? he asked by way of answer. That is no affair of yours, I returned, for I was not going to indulge his bestial curiosity. It changes nothing in my present predicament. C'est vrai, ça? he acknowledged with a laugh. Oui, c'est vrai. Et d'où venez-vous? A better man than I might have felt nettled. Oh, said I, I'm not going to answer any of your questions, so you may spare yourself the trouble of putting them. I am late enough already. I want help. If you will not guide me yourself, at least help me to find someone else who will. Hold on, he cried suddenly. Was it not you who passed in the meadow while it was still day? Yes, yes, said the girl, whom I had not hitherto recognised. It was Monsieur. I told him to follow the cow. As for you, mademoiselle, said I, you are a farceuse. And, added the man, what the devil have you done to be still here? What the devil indeed. But there I was. The great thing, said I, is to make an end of it. And once more proposed that he should help me to find a guide. Seca, he said again. Seca. Il fait noir. Very well, said I. Take one of your lanterns. No, he cried, drawing a thought backward, and again entrenching himself behind one of his former phrases. I will not cross the door. I looked at him. I saw unaffected terror struggling on his face with unaffected shame. He was smiling pitifully and wetting his lips with his tongue like a detected schoolboy. I drew a brief picture of my state and asked him what I was to do. I don't know, he said, but I will not cross the door. Here was the beast of Gévedon, and no mistake. Sir, said I with my most commanding manners, you are a coward. And with that I turned my back upon the family party, who hastened to retire within their fortifications. And the famous door was closed again, but not till I had overheard the sound of laughter. Filia Barbara, Pata Barbario, a barbarous daughter with an even more barbarous father. Let me say it in the plural, the beasts of Gévaudan. The lanterns had somewhat dazzled me, and I ploughed distressfully among stones and rubbish heaps. All the other houses in the village were both dark and silent, 
and though I knocked it here and there, a door, my knocking was unanswered. It was a bad business. I gave up Fusiak with my curses. The rain had stopped, and the wind, which still kept rising, began to dry my coat and trousers. Very well, thought I, water or no water, I must camp. But the first thing was to return to Modestine. I am pretty sure I was twenty minutes groping for my lady in the dark, and if it had not been for the unkindly services of the bog into which I once more stumbled, I might have still been groping for her at the dawn. My next business was to gain the shelter of a wood, for the wind was cold as well as boisterous. How, in this well-wooded district, I should have been so long in finding one is another of the insoluble mysteries of this day's adventures. But I will take my oath that I put near an hour to the discovery. At last, black trees began to show upon my left, and suddenly crossing the road, made a cave of unmitigated blackness right in front. I call it a cave without exaggeration. To pass below that arch of leaves was like entering a dungeon. I felt about until my hand encountered a stout branch, and to this I tied Modestine, a haggard, drenched, desponding donkey. Then I lowered my pack, laid it along the wall on the margin of the road, and unbuckled the straps. I knew well enough where the lantern was, but where were the candles? I groped and groped among the tumbled articles, and while I was thus groping, suddenly I touched the spirit lamp, salvation. This would serve my turn as well. The wind roared unwearyingly among the trees. I could hear the boughs tossing and the leaves churning through half a mile of forest. Yet the scene of my encampment was not only as black as the pit, but admirably sheltered. At the second match, the wick caught fire. The light was both livid and shifting, but it cut me off from the universe and doubled the darkness of the surrounding night. I tied Modestine more conveniently for herself and broke up half the black bread for her supper, reserving the other half against the morning. Then I gathered what I should want within reach took off my wet boots and gaiters, which I wrapped in my waterproof, arranged my knapsack for a pillow under the flap of my sleeping bag, insinuated my limbs into the interior, and buckled myself in like a bambino. I opened a tin of bologna sausage and broke a cake of chocolate, and that was all I had to eat. It may sound offensive, but I ate them together, bite by bite by way of bread and meat. All I had to wash down this revolting mixture was neat brandy, a revolting beverage in itself. But I was rare and hungry, ate well, and smoked one of the best cigarettes in my experience. Then I put a stone in my straw hat, pulled the flap of my fur cap over my neck and eyes, put my revolver ready but to my hand, and snuggled well down among the sheepskins. I questioned at first if I were sleepy, <clears throat> for I felt my heart beating faster than usual, as if with an agreeable excitement to which my mind remained a, remained a stranger. But as soon as my eyelids touched, that subtle glue leapt between them, and they would no more come separate. The wind among the trees was my lullaby. Sometimes it sounded for minutes together with a steady even rush not rising nor abating, and again it would swell and burst like a great crashing breaker, and the trees would patter me all over with big drops from the rain of the afternoon. Night after night in my own bedroom in the country, I have given ear to this perturbing concert of the wind among the woods, but whether it was a difference in the trees or the lie of the ground, or because I was myself outside and in the midst of it, the fact remains that the wind sang to a different tune among those woods of Gévaudan. I hearkened and hearkened, 
and meanwhile sleep took gradual possession of my body and subdued my thoughts and senses. But still my last waking effort was to listen and distinguish and my last conscious state was one of wonder at the foreign clamour in my ears. Twice in the course of the dark hours, once when a stone galled me underneath the sack, and again when the poor patient Modestine, growing angry, poured and stamped upon the road, I was recalled for a brief while to consciousness, and saw a star or two overhead, and the lace-like edge of the foliage against the sky. When I awoke for the third time, Wednesday, September the 25th, the world was flooded with a blue light, the mother of the dawn. I saw the leaves labouring in the wind and the ribbon of the road, and on turning my head, there was Modestine, tied to a beach and standing half across the path in an attitude of inimitable patience. I closed my eyes again and set to thinking over the experience of the night. I was surprised to find how easy and pleasant it had been, even in this tempestuous weather. The stone which annoyed me would not have been there had I not been forced to camp blindfold in the opaque night. And I had felt no other inconvenience except when my feet encountered the lantern or the second volume of Pera's Pastors of the Desert among the mixed contents of my sleeping bag. Nay, more. I had felt not a touch of cold and awakened with unusually lightsome and clear sensations. With that, I shook myself got once more into my boots and gaiters, and breaking up the rest of the bread for Modestine, strolled about to see in what part of the world I had awakened. Ulysses, left on Ithaca, and with a mind unsettled by the goddess, was no more pleasantly astray. I have been after an adventure all my life, a pure, dispassionate adventure, such as befell early and heroic voyagers, and thus to be found by morning in a random woodside nook in Gévaudan, not knowing north from south, as strange to my surroundings as the first man upon the earth, an inland castaway, was to find a fraction of my daydreams realised. I was on the skirts of a little wood of birch, sprinkled with a few beeches, behind it adjoined another wood of fir, and in front it broke up and went down in open order into a shallow and meadowy dale. All around there were bare, bare hilltops, some near, some far away, as the perspective closed or opened, but none apparently much higher than the rest. The wind huddled the trees. The golden specks of autumn in the birches tossed shiveringly. Overhead the sky was full of strings and shreds of vapour, flying, vanishing, reappearing, and turning about an axis like tumblers as the wind hounded them through heaven. It was wild weather and famishing cold. I ate some chocolate, swallowed a mouthful of brandy, and smoked a cigarette before the cold should have time to disable my fingers. By the time I had got all this done, I had made my pack and bound it on the pack saddle. The day was tiptoe on the threshold of the east. We had not gone many steps along the lane before the sun, still invisible to me, sent a glow of gold over some cloud mountains that lay ranged along the eastern sky. The wind had us on the stern and hurried us bitingly forward. I buttoned myself into my coat and walked on in a pleasant frame of mind with all men, when suddenly, at a corner, there was Fusiek once more in front of me. Not only that, but there was the old gentleman who had escorted me so far the night before, running out of his house at sight of me with hands upraised in horror. My poor boy, he cried, what does this mean? I told him what had happened. He beat his old hands like clappers in a mill to think how lightly he had let me go. But when he heard of the man of Fusiak, anger and depression seized upon his mind. 
This time at least, said he, there shall be no mistake. And he limped along, for he was very rheumatic, for about half a mile, and until I was almost within sight of Shalar, the destination I had hunted for so long.